On a wall in front of the Minnesota Judicial Center is an excerpt from the Minnesota Constitution that reads, every person is entitled to obtain justice freely and without purchase completely and without denial promptly and without delay conformable with the law. The creation of the Court of Appeals was to address the fact that everyone deserves a first appeal. You don't just put on the robe and you know everything. It is an active learning process all the time. I would have to describe the, the, the job of an appellate judge as one of a, a juggler on a treadmill. Looking at the, uh, the lawyers and judges who preceded us, they uh, left for us a legacy of integrity uh, in the practice of law. The year was 1857. An election was held in the Minnesota Territory to select delegates who would draft and ratify the state's first constitution. Looking back, it is evident that the more things change, the more they stay the same, because intense rivalries between the Republicans and Democrats back then prevented delegates from ever coming together to agree on a single state constitution. As a result, Minnesota ended up with two constitutions until 1974, when a revised one was approved by voters. Fortunately, the difference between the two constitutions was minor, and both established a judicial system comprised of many trial courts around the state and one Supreme Court to hear appeals. At the time of the uh, beginning of the state, there were a relatively fewer number of appeals, so they could be handled by the Supreme Court. Uh, up until, you know, the middle of the 20th century, I think it was, the system worked fine, but then lawsuits became more numerous and uh, appeals became more numerous, and eventually the Supreme Court could not uh, do its work properly as a Supreme Court should. To put the situation in context, in 1957, 215 cases were filed with the Minnesota Supreme Court. By the late 1970s, filings had soared to around 1,500 per year. I remember Justice Otis, who lived near us, would be, and was on the court at that time, he would come back from the court at the end of the day and he would start reading briefs and he would fall asleep on the couch and sometimes as we walked by his house and we would see him sleeping under his tented briefs. Everybody was just overwhelmed who was working with the court. The time between hearing, should you get a hearing, and not all cases got them, and the issuance of the decision began to grow and was quite long. Before the creation of the Court of Appeals, appellate decision-making in Minnesota was in a very, very difficult situation. I was on the trial court and if there were appeals that came out of the trial courts, you waited forever to get any type of a determination. And then when you got it, it would be a one-line summary affirmance without any reasons given for the decision. And in, it was worse if it were um, a reversal. I didn't have any reversals during that time. But the, uh, imagine as a trial court judge, if your case a decision you made and you're trying to do your best would get reversed, but it, the reason for its reversal would not be given. The point at which the Court of Appeals was established was really, I think, the breaking point for our system. Members of the Supreme Court were very uncomfortable with the situation, and that was especially true for Chief Justice Robert Sheeran, who retired in December of 1981, and for his successor, Douglas Amdahl. When Amdahl took over as Chief Justice, the court was indeed at a breaking point. Amdahl knew something had to be done. Five months after Amdahl became Chief Justice, he was questioning whether he would continue on the court. In a letter to a friend, he described working 10 to 13 hour days, seven days a week, and having to make an average of five decisions a day. There's no question that, um, but that Doug Amdahl and Bob Sharon are the godfathers of the court. Judges are used to being in a black robe in a room and deciding cases and not actually out advocating. And so in order to get the amendment passed and get the court created, he had to take on a very different role for his personality and skill set and actually be in the forefront of serious discussion and argument about the pros and cons of the court and he did it so successfully. We got the amendment passed and the court created, 
and justice back into the system in the state of Minnesota. Amdahl accomplished this by taking his case to the people of Minnesota. The need for action is no longer debatable. If we are going to maintain the position that everyone is entitled to one appeal, something has to be done in order to maintain that. Amdahl formed a large coalition, including both the Democratic and Republican candidates running for governor in 1982. Wheelock Whitney. Rudy These diverse people and organizations are united on one point. They agree that Minnesota's courts must be improved. Join these people and vote yes November 2nd on the State Appeals Court Amendment and get a court system that does Minnesota justice. The story at the time was that if any three people got together, Judge Jamdahl would be there to talk to them about it. And I, I don't think that's much of an exaggeration. I wanted a thousand speakers making the same speech in a thousand different places. You never quite reach that, but we didn't come too far away from it either. There's fear of change. We had never had a court of appeals, so uh, why do we need one? Former Governor Levander uh, did express uh, opposition to it, primarily on political grounds. He felt that one governor shouldn't be able to have uh, 12 appointments to the court. Uh, Levander later uh, said after the court was in operation that his opposition was uh, misguided and that he supported the uh, court as it existed. Uh, one of the uh, ways of offsetting the increased cost uh, argument uh, was uh, the amendment uh, reduced the number of Supreme Court justices from nine to seven. Passing a constitutional amendment is no easy task. To, to pass a, a constitutional amendment, you have to get a majority of the number of people who actually voted in the election. If people go out to vote for a gubernatorial candidate, but then they don't vote uh, one way or another in the, uh, on the question of amending the, the Constitution, that basically has the effect of being a no vote. Our biggest problem with constitutional amendments was that they were in lower left-hand corner, upper right-hand corner, always of the ballot. So people who were just looking at the main ballot didn't pay any attention to these things. Late one evening, it occurred to Amdahl that election judges would be meeting around the state the next day for a training session prior to the election. He mobilized immediately. I got one judge out of bed in every judicial district of the state. I said, you get down to your county auditor. I knew the county auditor is going to have the election judges in for an educational program. You get to down to your county auditor tomorrow and tell them to be sure to tell the election judges, to tell the voters to, to look for the constitutional amendments. Well, it worked so well, not only did my constitutional amendment, the Court of Appeals pass, railroad bonding pass, horse racing pass, and then there was another one, <laughs> but every, that year everything passed. It is now May of 1983. Peter Popovich, a St. Paul attorney and former state legislator, receives an early morning call from the newly elected governor, Rudy Perpich. So I said, what can I do for you? And he said, well, Chief Justice Omdahl, uh, you know, we won the election in November, and now it says we'd better get going. This was May. Court's going to go into operation in November. And he said, I would like you to become the first chief judge of that court. So we started to talk about things, too. We had to get quarters. We had to hire people. We had to get announcements out. And all of us were very enthusiastic about convincing the naysayers that we, in fact, had been a good idea, that we, the Court of Appeals was going to function well, that this was going to be a positive benefit for the courts in system in Minnesota. So we, were, we went at it with enthusiasm. Chief Judge Popovich went around to intermediate appellate courts in the United States to, to find out just exactly how they were, um, what, how they were enacting their rules, the impact of the rules, uh, particularly uh, a, a, a review of the Colorado Court of Appeals, which is more similar to the Minnesota uh, Court of Appeals. Uh, yes, so this, this court had to carve out an identity, and I think that it's important to acknowledge that the first chief judge, Peter Popovich, uh, helped carve out that identity uh, when uh, he helped uh, lead the first court. And Chief Justice Omdahl, of course, who was instrumental in getting the creation of the court and the amendment passed. Peter Popovich, and I knew him a little bit, uh, he was a young lawyer, 
was, was a very hardworking man and he set a really hardworking standard for the court when it started out. He uh, required uh, that a, an opinion be written in every case and uh, that uh, the results be uh, determined in a relatively short period of time. I mean, there's so many early leaders. Uh, I think the composition of the Court of Appeals was just an unbelievable group of um, strong legal minds, unbelievable, hardworking. There was a lot of effort, even if by one governor and one party, to appoint a diverse bench. And they accomplished that, both in their outlook, their work habits, and what strengths they brought to the court. Each and every one of them came with sort of a different circle that they had been in and really complemented and tested each other. Shortly after I joined the court, in May of 2006, I'd been on the court for probably three months, I walked into the robing room uh, with the other panel members of our court and the presiding judge for that particular panel was Judge Edward Toussaint. And I remember he looked at me and he looked at the other judge on the panel and he said, I think this is a historic moment. And I knew right away what he was talking about and I did some research later and it was, I think, more historic than even he thought. This was, um, I was on the panel, Judge Edward Toussaint was on the panel, and Judge Mimi Wright, Wilhelmina Wright, was on the panel. This was the first time in the history of the state of Minnesota that an appellate court was hearing a case uh, where the, the, the appellate panel was comprised entirely of African American judges. And at first I thought, that's kind of an interesting and fun fact. And it occurred to me that Dred Scott had been a slave 160 years before we were sitting that day. And he would have been a slave just nine miles down the road at Fort Snelling. So here's, the, here's Dred Scott sitting at Fort Snelling. And he was denied by the highest appellate court in the country of his freedom. In fact, told by that court he couldn't even be an American citizen, even if he was free. And here we were sitting, the first time in Minnesota, and for my limited research, the first time in the country, any appellate court anywhere was comprised entirely of African-American jurists just nine miles up the road from where he sat. I imagine that, that uh, Chief Justice Taney was rolling over in his grave at that moment. Over the past four decades, the court's functionality has evolved to meet Minnesota's needs, but it remains true to the values and structure ordained by the enabling legislation, the first judges, and early court staff. Our typical week would be we're in court one day a week, and it will be a combination of oral argument and non-oral conferences on cases. The number of cases on the calendar varies, but it generally uh, hovers around six. So we'll have six cases to prepare for every week. So at any given moment, a judge on our court will be preparing for oral argument for the, the coming week. Uh, we'll be reviewing a first draft or perhaps writing a first draft of an opinion from a, a case that was heard the week before. Um, we'll be redrafting or editing or modifying a previous draft. Sometimes these go through multiple revisions. It's, it's a very uh, kind of mixed balance of research, preparation, reading, and then uh, hearing cases, and then writing and editing. The three judges assigned to a case will always get together in person uh, around a conference table and discuss and decide the case, and that is uh, a very useful part of, of the decision-making process. Our law clerks are extremely important in the process because uh, the judges vary, everyone can do what they choose to do, but I rely on my clerks for the first draft of a decision, and then I edit and revise and go back and forth with the law clerk from there. But that first draft is extremely helpful. I genuinely believe that the best decision is the one that's done collaboratively by, by three different people instead of just a single person. And all of this is happening at the same time with various cases, and as soon as you finish one, the next one is coming up for, for your consideration. In the vast majority of our cases, we have three uh, unanimous panel votes of three votes. Uh, and occasionally you will get a, a two to one vote, which means that one of the judges is dissenting. We also get concurrences. It's a small percentage. We keep track of uh, the dissents and which judges are doing them. Some judges dissent more often than others. But one, uh, one issue the media misses consistently on the two to one decisions that they uh, report on is this. They report on the majority opinion and they often name the author of that opinion and they go into some detail on it. 
And then towards the end of their reporting, they talk about uh, the dissent, and they often mention uh, the judge in the dissent. What's always been amusing to me is that they're kind of missing the fact that the third judge decided the case. And that judge usually is not mentioned uh, because you have a 1-1 vote. It's a 2-1 result, and that judge is the one who went one way or the other uh, and made the majority opinion the majority opinion. Uh, and that is an interesting mechanism that goes on in our panels. We do what are called intra-panel circulations when judges are, are not sure they agree with each other. Uh, and by the time they've read each other's uh, proposed opinions, that's when it becomes uh, either a 3-0 or a 2-1. A significant percentage of Court of Appeals judges first served at the district court level. The difference in the cultures is dramatic. Mike Kirk, who was on our court, uh, called me after he became, uh, was appointed to our court. He'd been a district judge for a long time. And he asked me what the difference was, because I'd been a district judge myself for just under 10 years. And I said it was the difference between having a, a seat at the circus and a seat in the library. Uh, and, I, and I think that pretty much sums it up. The, the district court is very tumultuous in, by nature. Long calendars, a lot of people shouting, everybody demanding your time. Uh, and it's exciting. I enjoyed my years there. And I think every appellate judge on this court who was a trial judge will tell you they enjoyed it. It is quite a change. There is a, a quietness to the Court of Appeals. Even if you walk into the chambers, you're, it's sort of a hush is going on. The life of an appellate judge uh, involves a lot of reading and writing, and uh, it's not a great spectator sport. What has been the most wonderful uh, element for me, in addition to the great work that we have and do, is the collegiality of this body. And it's a real pleasure now that I've been here eight years and chief for almost six, and to honestly be able to say, we have judges who disagree with each other, but like each other and respect each other and perform accordingly. We try to have occasional social outings and, and you know, actually break bread together, which I think makes a big difference. Over the years, a number of former legislators have been appointed to the Court of Appeals, and that experience gave them a unique perspective. You know, when you're in the legislature, there's criticism of the courts any time a decision comes down where a legislator thinks, well, that's not what I meant. And you, you develop something of an, a strong attitude that the courts should, uh, should apply what the legislature said. Now, when you get to the, become a member of the court, you're presented with, frequently, with two laws that seem inconsistent or contradictory. And you're saying, why doesn't the legislature say more clearly what it means? M my attitude was that the legislature is responsible for writing the, the statutes. And I, it was my obligation to try to understand what the legislature meant when it wrote a statute. And to the extent I could, or to the extent the language was clear and there's no argument about what the legislature meant, I always thought it was my obligation to just enforce the statute. Uh, we are not a policy-making court, which is not to say that there won't be instances when cases are coming to us that are a case of first impression. And so we'll be put in a, a position of looking at policy. But our real function is error correcting. The volume of appeals resolved by the Court of Appeals shows that the court successfully carries out its early mission and vision. Our, our court now is, I think, a high volume court. Uh, each judge considers and decides approximately 200, 225 uh, appeals per year, and authors an opinion for the court in approximately 70 or 75 uh, cases. About roughly a third of our decisions are appealed to the Supreme Court, and they take roughly 4% uh, uh, of all our cases. And generally speaking, they affirm us about half the time and, and reverse half the time. So if you actually count the affirmances, it's closer to 98%. Uh, of our decisions being more or less the last word. We have uh, continued to take the burden off the Supreme Court. We also have continued to allow oral arguments. The oral argument uh, function in the Court of Appeals is very unusual nationally. There are not a lot of appellate courts, intermediate appellate courts, that allow for oral argument. And it's such a benefit you know, for students to be able to see it, for other lawyers to see it, for people to have their cases argued orally and to keep the, you know, the body of law in Minnesota vital. The Minnesota Court of Appeals is in the top three in the country as far as number of opinions per judge per year and in the, the depth 
uh, and the full nature of those opinions, reciting the facts of the case and, and all of the reasons for the decision. The Minnesota Judicial Branch is really focused on trying to be one court around the entire state. Um, and part of the mission with that is to provide high quality and consistent and convenient court services no matter what court you're going to around the state. In these rapidly changing times, all institutions face challenges. I think the real challenge or danger for our court is the same as it is for any appellate court, which is a tendency to be drawn into what I would call the uh, political vortex. It's up to individual judges to stand against that and to make decisions not based upon a propensity to, to be a change agent for the law, but just to decide the case based upon the law that the people have given, because it's the people's law, not the courts. Minnesota's judicial selection process has had a major positive impact on the provision of justice in our state. Governor Cui made outstanding contributions to the quality of the judges in Minnesota. Um, Governor Cui uh, established the Judicial Selection Commission that's been followed by every governor since uh, his time. It's an effort to uh, take as much as possible the politics out of the appointment and uh, make it uh, strictly on the basis of, of merit. He was ahead of the curve nationally for looking at these things. Uh, they consider a large number of applicants and they, they uh, do their due diligence to evaluate people's work experience and their backgrounds. And I can tell you that throughout the entire process from the original interviews to interviews with the governor, there was virtually no sense of political overtone to the process and I was heartened by that. And the states where judges run with political party identification. Those are the states where you end up with very expensive judicial races. The big money starts to come in. It, and then the public develops an expectation that the court is going to rule in a particular way. The Court of Appeals judges value the hard work of the entire staff at the court. I would say the quality of our court's work is enhanced tremendously by the exceptional quality of our staff. And that goes from staff attorneys uh, who master certain subject matter of the law, our judicial administrative assistants, and our law clerks. Cindy Lair, who has been the chief staff attorney since April of 1984, uh, deserves a huge amount of credit for uh, establishing processes and systems that uh, have served the court very well. And one issue that I uh, am, am quite proud of, and I think it's a lasting legacy, is that I was able to get uh, the funding uh, and the agreement from the Judicial Council to create the position of a court administrator for the Court of Appeals. I think that the two, uh, the two women now that have been administrators, currently it's Miriam Friesen, have been outstanding and they've shown how important it was to have a court administrator. It frees us to concentrate on what we're here for, which, which is to consider appeals and make decisions and uh, write uh, effective and coherent opinions. So what I think my most important role as a court administrator is, um, is to see from a big picture how the court operates and um, to kind of see from a, a bird's eye view how all of the different roles of uh, court personnel work together and our, our procedures around each of those roles. And it gives me the opportunity to see the ways that we could be better carrying out the mission of the court. Law clerks have enjoyed a rich experience working at the court. You know, many outstanding lawyers and jurists start out as law clerks. So yes, I think uh, by the time they're, po they're appointed here in our court, selected by judges to clerk, they've gone uh, through a bit of a gauntlet already through application process and interviews. Uh, so they should be proud of the fact that they were selected for this court. Uh, they'll be exhausted at times when, uh, when they're done working on opinions in this court but they'll be better writers, uh, they'll understand the law better, and we expect great things of them. We expect them to push back on our own views about the law so we can have a real meaningful discussion before we reach a decision, so we get real full deliberation. But I think that they receive excellent experience, which makes them a better lawyer uh, when, they, when they get into practice, and that, I think, serves their clients well and also uh, when, they're, when they are lawyers appearing in court, I think they present their cases in a better way and that helps the courts ultimately as well. 
Even if you're on the right track, if you don't keep up with technology, you'll have problems. One of the most significant changes in the court in the time I was on it, I was on the court, is the, the role that technology plays. When I started on the court, uh, we, whenever we heard a case, we would need to get the record that was created in the, in the district court or the, the county board or whatever, whoever's decision we were reviewing. And that meant actually getting a, a, a pile of paper. It, sometimes it could be just a, a single folder of paper or it could be many boxes of paper. And in order to uh, review the record, it would be literally sifting through page after page in, in, a, in, a, in a, a stack of papers. But, but just a few years ago, the court uh, completed a process of putting all the records online. So I could, by the time I left the court, I could be at my desk at the, at the terminal, the uh, computer terminal at my desk, and I could call up the records from cases that were in, uh, that took place in any of the 87 counties around the state. And I'm not a real computer literate person, not real uh, comfortable with computers. And I was really skeptical when the whole process started. I thought this is, this is gonna be a debacle, but it turned out, I mean, even for someone with my limited computer skills, it turned out to be a real uh, improvement of the system. Well, one of the issues, of course, is that the longtime uh, judges who are in uh, former lawyers, of course, are used to paper. I'm one of them. Uh, and so we still prefer, most of us, not all of us, but most of us prefer to work with written briefs. It's easier to, to get to a passage on a transcript or a brief uh, during an oral argument for most of us uh, if it's in paper because we can uh, still tab it. That said, it's, it's no question that uh, we're in the process of moving to the point where uh, judges will be using uh, uh, notebooks, laptops, et cetera, and will not be using paper uh, in the years ahead. In terms of case law, technology has changed the world we live in. It starts at the top in the, in the United States Supreme Court, uh, where you've had decisions involving cell phones and, and uh, what, whether you need a warrant to, to search your cell phone. It, it percolates down to, to the Court of Appeals uh, from the federal system, uh, social networking, um, social media, has led to all kinds of issues regarding First Amendment. Uh, Facebook right now is facing hate speech issues, which have been around for a long time, but not in that context. Uh, so technology has also led to a great deal of changes in the case law. And what will these decisions mean down the road as, as things change? You know, whole notions of privacy, um, availability of information, all of those things are changing dramatically, not because the law is changing, but because technology and, and the world is changing and the, one of the real challenges will be whether the law can keep up with the changes. The authority of any court derives not just from the statutes and the Constitution, but from the trust of the public. I can tell you Minnesota does have uh, an outstanding reputation and you know, over the last 36 years. Uh, there have been seven chief judges now and, and I think uh, everyone pushed the ball forward. I think the impact of the court uh, has been outstanding. Uh, the, uh, the law has continued to develop in an orderly way, in uh, a way that meets the demands of uh, justice. Uh, and uh, the uh, need to overturn the Court of Appeals has not presented itself in a large number of cases. So I. My view is judged by any standard, the Intermediate Court of Appeals has been a, a great success for the state of Minnesota. Our judges are good about looking at the cases, applying the law to the facts as the court best understands them based upon what happened in the district court. And I've been completely impressed with the judges on our court who have resisted the temptation to put their thumb on the scale in deciding how the case comes out. And I truly, truly believe that the Minnesota Court of Appeals has done Minnesota justice. The creation of the Court of Appeals really captures the spirit of Minnesota at that time. The spirit of the legislature, judges, lawyers, citizens, and citizen groups who once they perceived a problem came together to solve it. As a result, we have a court system that the people expected to work and it does work by delivering justice to Minnesota.